Hey there, I'm excited to announce this to you today. This is what you've been waiting for in your spiritual quest. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm finally ready to announce it that it's ready to go. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. Now, this is a sanctuary where like-minded souls are united in their journey through grief and towards personal transformation. It's more than just a place. It's a beginning. It's a commitment to growth and understanding. Here you're finding not just a community, but you're entering a circle of trust and depth. You're going to engage with interactive coursework. You'll dive into exclusive podcast episodes and partake in discussions that illuminate the path from mourning to empowerment. This is a realm where every question is honored and every individual's journey is validated. To be part of this exclusive circle, visit us at grieftogrowth.com slash community or look for the chat icon at the bottom of every page on the main website. Remember, the entry is a privilege because I want to ensure that every member is as dedicated and genuine as you are. You must apply to join, but the journey within is worth every step. So go ahead and join us today. Check it out, grieftogrowth.com slash community, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi there. Welcome to Grief to Growth Podcast. Your host is Brian Smith, spiritual seeker, best-selling author, grief survivor, and life coach. Brian believes that the worst tragedies of life provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Brian says he was planted, not buried, and he is here to help you grow where you've been planted by the difficulties in life. In each episode, Brian and his guests will share what has helped them to survive and thrive. It is his sincere hope this episode helps you today. Hey, everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth, and I'm here today with Lisa Samet. Uh, Lisa uh, has written a book called Emotional Repatterning. We're going to talk today primarily about the book. But before we get into it, I want to introduce Lisa and let you know who she is. Uh, She's a well-known health practitioner who has appeared on the Dr. Oz Show to promote homeopathy and naturopathic healing. Uh, She has an international practice based in Montreal specializing in homeopathy, emotional wellness, nutrition, and lifestyle optimization. When emotional issues are an obstacle to healing, Dr. Samet uses the emotional repatterning techniques presented in her book to help patients uncover and rebalance the deep subconscious beliefs that often underlie their unhappiness, their stuckness, and or their and their mental or physical pain. The results have been nothing short of life-changing. She's written this book to broaden access to the tools that she uses in her practice to help people change their perspectives, their subconscious beliefs, and ultimately the suffer left, less. After she graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and following 10 years in marketing with, Dr., with Procter & Gamble, Dr. Samet realized that her real love was naturopathic healing. She received her doctorate from the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in 1998, and she's been in private practice since then. Naturopathic healing focuses on prevention and using natural approaches to stimulate the body's ability to heal itself. The primary goals of of the naturopathic approach are to address the cause of illness rather than simply treat or suppress symptoms and to treat the patient as a whole physically, mentally, and emotionally to regain optimal health. Now, Dr. Samet publishes a monthly newsletter with over a 1,000 subscribers, and she's uh, is the featured author on, of Dr. Samet's Insights, a monthly blog on the Washington Homeopathic Products website, which receives approximately 60,000 visits per month. She's a lecturer, and she's a presenter of webinars on various topics, including emotional, repat- emotional repattering, homeopathy, menopause, and the aging brain. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. Lisa Samet. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. That was uh, quite an introduction. You, you've done quite a bit, as we kind of talked about before we got started. So I wanted to ask you about how you got into the idea of emotional repat- repatterning. Oh, well, that's a great question. So I've been in practice, as you said, for over 20 years, and uh, it's really an honor, actually, and a blessing to be on the receiving end of so many patient stories and confidences. Uh, and as you work with people in such an in-depth manner over such a long period of time, you come to see, you know, the depth of human suffering, right? I mean, I know about my own sufferings over time with faces, the challenges that I've been faced with, but you know, everybody's carrying a big load, right? And if, and if it's not true today, well, it might be true next year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you get close to people and they confide in you, we, we come to realize that it's, it's almost kind of the basic human 
story that we're going to be faced by challenges and we're going to have to kind of suffer through them. And I guess over the past years, as I've gotten more and more interested in working with people on the emotional level, you know, I, 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 I became kind of disillusioned at a certain point. It's like, well, how come nobody has ever given us the tools to work through this stuff any better? I mean, I was raised by pretty smart parents. I did a lot of schooling. And I mean, nobody ever talked to me about how to navigate some of these difficult waters. And, and I think it's true of all of us that we don't simply have the tools to, to manage life well. And isn't that a shame? Because we learned so much garbage in school that we're never going to use. Uh, but the basics of how to be human and how to, how to live life better with less suffering uh, nobody's adept at that, and, and nobody ever really talked about that. And I wondered, why didn't anyone ever teach me about this? And, uh, you know, I, I came to realize it's because the people who raised me and my teachers and various other people who had influence in my life, they themselves didn't know. And, and that, that's kind of an amazing uh, realization. Yeah, it, it really is. As you were talking, I was thinking about, I wrote a book uh, many years ago about emotional intelligence. And 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 it was, I, for me, it was like groundbreaking, but nobody talks about that. We talk about all different types of intelligence. We talk about, you know, IQ. We don't talk about the emotional, you know, intelligence. And so you're right. I think our society really lacks in that. So you, you uh, went from your career in, in marketing and you wanted to help people. And so you got into naturopathic medicine, um, which is really helpful, but it still focuses on the body mostly, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a good question. Not really. Um, okay. You know, naturopathic medicine and homeopathy in particular is mm-hmm. very much focused on the whole person, and and that's really physically, mentally, and emotionally. And you know, you and I both know that the mind-body connection is real. I mean, you know, when you talk to people who are ill, chronically ill. Um, you know, I would say eight times out of 10, if you interview them, which is what I do in my practice, when I, as I'm trying to help them, you obviously need to hear their story. Uh, you will find that there was an emotional stress, a trauma, a disappointment, an injustice, a grief. There was usually something that preceded their illness within the year before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just would make you wonder if we had better tools uh, of how to navigate the emotional difficulties that we're all bound to face on this planet. It's not that any of us really get away without confronting some of this stuff. Um, If they would have gotten sick, because I think when emotions and griefs and things are not well processed, they end up, you know, causing disease because, you know, ill health is often related to emotional uh, distress. And so it's hard to separate them actually. And, you know, there's plenty of treatments for the body. Uh, there's not a lot of soft treatments for the emotion. And I say soft treatments, and I'm not talking about antidepressants, anti-anxiety pills, and all the rest, because I don't think that's a solution to anything. That's more of a, a palliative approach, right? Like manage the symptoms, don't really treat what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, there's not a whole lot available to people to help them go through difficulties without making themselves sick. And so I guess my interest over time has become more and more focused on that realm. Yeah, I think, I think what you said is really interesting. I, I read a book, uh, it's called Lost Connections, and it's about depression and, and, and the causes of it. And when I was reading this book, what fascinated me is like traditional medicine thinks that depression is just a product of the brain. It's just bad brain chemistry. And yeah. if we can fix the brain chemistry, we can fix the, the depression. With the, and they don't even look at like, what happened to you in the last year, as you were just saying? You know, if they would if they just ask you what actually happened to you, what's your emotional state like, we could see that a lot of it is, you know, it's caused by something in our life. Right. And, you know, why, why don't they ask you? Because if you told them, they would have nothing to offer, you know, which, which is exactly the point. People don't know what to do with it, you know, and even though it would be your doctor, you'd say, oh, my husband left me and, you know, all of this happened. And, and then what, what would the doctor then offer you? I mean, he would still write you the prescription. Right. Yeah. So you know, people don't have the tools to help people, and you know that was a real nickel-dropping moment for me because it's like, wow, why don't people know better? It's not like we're the first people to experience difficulty, right? Why don't people know better how to manage this stuff? It's 
it's manageable. I mean, it's a ma yes, you have to do some deep work. You have to change perspectives. You have to be willing to step back a bit and 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 have some self awareness and have a determination to to use some tools. But it is possible. And and what's the result of that effort? Well, you come out better. You come out stronger. You come out wiser, more resilient. And hopefully, you can tackle the next challenge that comes your way with a bit more finesse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So what, what actually is emotional repatterning? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, there's something I want to tell you about today. My podcast platform, Buzzsprout, has recently made it easier for me to allow you to support me financially. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash subscribe. That's grief, the number two growth.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up to support me financially. Now, you can do it for as little as $3 a month or, of course, as much as you'd like. If you do that, you'll get access to bonus episodes, and you'll see those in the regular feed. They'll have a lock on them. But when you become a subscriber, you'll actually get access to your own private feed, and you'll be able to listen to the regular podcast along with the bonus podcast for the subscribers. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for sharing the podcast. And I want to thank those of you who support me financially. Have a great day, and on to the episode. Uh, you know, I I think what I would say in answer to that is, you know, how it's come about that I wrote the book, and you know why I've named it that. Mm -hmm. So in in working with patients on a on a deep level, and you know, kind of helping them navigate what they were going through, I, I came to realize that you know we're all suffering from more or less the same stuff. I mean, you know, the details are different. The things that are upsetting to you, Brian, maybe not the things that cause me grief, and vice versa, mm -hmm. but but when you boil it all down, while the details might be uh, different, the root causes are very, very similar. And, and so I started to see patterns. It's like, well, we're all suffering from certain things. And I'll call them, let's say, misperceptions. And I, I realized that, well, for me, they, they kind of boil down into eight thinking traps. That's what I call them in my book, Emotional Repatterning. I mm -hmm. I use a chapter to discuss each of the eight thinking traps. And I'll mm. put that in quotes. You know, what's mm -hmm. a thinking trap? It's a way that our mind gets tangled up in a certain way of seeing something or not seeing something that causes us pain, causes us suffering, causes us distress. And so uh, the first part of the book is really kind of bringing to light these eight patterns or thinking traps that kind of get us caught. Hmm. and get us caught in a in a way that we end up being unhappy and miserable and suffering and feel like we're we can't you know stuck let's say yeah yeah and so i think part part of it is recognizing that you know common to all of us it's not just my little shameful you know problem it, it, it's 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 humanity it's part of being human right and so i think first of all just having the conscious understanding of the thinking traps, and if we can have some uh, objectivity, we can recognize ourselves in a lot of these uh, thinking traps. And so emotional repatterning, to answer your question, is a way of transforming those thinking traps into something that works better, something that works better for us. Wow. Okay. So what are some of the thinking traps? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all eight of them if you like, and sure. we can talk in depth about, uh, about maybe ones that you find interesting. So sure. self-love is one of them, or lack of, uh, acceptance, or lack of, uh, responsibility, or not taking appropriately responsibility for the pieces in the story that are ours. Uh, another one is called stories, which is essentially... What do I tell myself about the facts that happened, right? So certain facts happened, and then I have my story about those facts, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are many stories that could be told about a certain set of facts. And so right. I guess the question is, is the story I'm telling myself one that perpetuates my suffering? Or is it one that possibly makes me feel better? Or is it just a neutral version of the facts? But there are many stories that can be told. So... We go into that quite a bit. We talk also about co-creation and the fact that we're not alone, that there is, we are connected to whatever you want to call it, the universe, 
our higher selves, God, whatever the name is that you like. Mm -hmm. And by recognizing that, maybe we can recognize that we're working with a bigger force. We're not really alone here. Another uh, thinking trap is not recognizing that a lot of the challenges that we go through are actually gifts. Gifts given to us by universe. Uh, I do a chapter on regret because a lot of people are stuck in regret. And my final thinking trap is about death. Uh, because I'm sure you're aware, uh, people do not relate well with the topic of death, right? Death is a taboo in our society. Let's not talk about it. Let's not mention it. If we don't look at it, it's going to go away. Nobody really wants to really get the fact that this is what lies at the end of the road for each and every one of us. So why is it such a hush-hush? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, each of these is a chapter, and I, and I go through it in great detail. And the way I illustrate my point is by using uh, case examples from my practice. So each of the chapters is a series of stories of patients that I've worked with who, you know, have had issues that relate to each of the thinking traps. And so I think what happens there is it makes it very relatable because it's not just a philosophy or something like that. It's like this person came to my office and this is what they told me and this is how we kind of worked it through. And then, you know, maybe you can read that and say, oh my God, that's just like me, you know? And then you can say, wow, now I really understand. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was hoping to find a couple that were interesting to me, but unfortunately, they're all fascinating to me. I, I don't, I could, I couldn't pick a couple to 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 choose from because I think, as you said, we as human beings are universal and we're unique at the same time. We all, we all suffer from some of the same things, and then we each feel like we're alone. We each feel like this is this is unique to me. You know, the yeah. fact that I can't love myself, the fact that I have regrets about things, the fact that, yeah. you know, these the stories I tell myself, you know, and we all think that that there's just me. But for some reason, it seems like we we all come in and there was a book I read many years ago and, and he called it the wounds that we go through. And we yeah. come into this world and we're somehow not by not intentionally, you know, but we get these wounds and we we take them to heart and it just messes up the rest of our lives. Right. And, you know, for me, I would say it in a different way. For me, that's, that's called subconscious beliefs, right? So, you know, maybe that's the same as wounds. But, you mm-hmm. know, the second part of the book um, talks about the beliefs, the negative beliefs, the patterns that we have in our subconscious mind that is really what keeps us stuck in all of this stuff. Because, you know, as well as we might understand any of these concepts on a conscious level, a lot of the research that they've done on the brain in the past 20 years, and there's been a lot of, you know, neuroplasticity learning and many other uh, authors have written on these subjects. They've come to understand that the conscious mind is only aware of 5% of brain activity. And that means that 95% of what goes on in your brain is, is only in your subconscious uh, awareness or lack thereof, right? Because by definition, when it's subconscious, we don't really know what's in there, right? So, when we have subconscious beliefs, which we all do, uh, and that often comes from childhood. You know, when we're five, when we're seven, when we're three, and your dad screams at you, or your mother, uh, you know, has to go to work, and you feel neglected, or your teacher says, oh, you're never going to be good at math, or whatever it is, you know, we don't have the context to understand that these people are having a bad day, or that person shouldn't have said that, or my, you know, my father should take some anger management classes, or you know, we think we're wrong, right? Because, you know, these adults look like very big and smart people. So if there's a problem, it must be us. And so very early on, we start to take on certain beliefs about our own selves. And that's where some of the lack of self-love comes in. And then because we don't really have access to the subconscious mind, uh, we end up carrying all this garbage with us. And then 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, we're still being, you know, driven by these negative patterns that cloud our thinking. And, and that's astonishing, but it's, but it's real. And so in the second half of the book, Emotional Repatterning, I actually help people with certain tools and techniques to do that emotional repatterning. So we simply upgrade the old beliefs. It's like a software upgrade, right? The new version. The old beliefs that are not working for us, that may be, you know, a gazillion years old, and we replace instead new and better beliefs that are more relevant to who we are today that are going to help us thrive and move forward 
with our conscious goals, right? You know, we've all had the experience of saying, okay, I'm going to lose those 10 pounds. I'm going to exercise every day. I'm going to be a better friend. I'm going to stop screaming at my kids, whatever. We all have these great ideas and these goals and affirmations and all of this in our conscious mind. And how much of that do we actually end up doing? <laughs> yeah. You know, not many, right? And why is that? Because if your conscious goals are not supported by your subconscious beliefs, well, you're going to have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, and you're going to go basically nowhere. So the whole uh, opportunity here is not just to understand how to improve our conscious way of looking at things, but to align our subconscious beliefs with that so that we can really step in to change. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can completely relate to everything you just said. Cause you know, for me, I think about things that I was taught when I was five years old and 35 years later, I'm sitting here talking to a therapist and she's saying, you know, she's saying this stuff to me and I'm like, Oh, I never realized that, you know, where I'm carrying this around something from when I was five years old an experience that I had that the I'm 40 and I'm still, you know, stuck in this belief. And yeah. so it's it's really great to have a resource like this that I, where you can look at it and say, yeah, I can I can relate to that and understand because the first key is knowing we have it, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know what you said earlier is that you know we each think we're unique and at the same time we have this common humanity. I think this idea of our uniqueness, at least in what we're talking about today, is maybe not a benefit in the sense that you know it often feels like shame. You know, like, what's wrong with me that mm -hmm. I don't love myself? What's wrong with me that I don't understand how to navigate life better? And so that part that feels very individual is often very lonely. And not everybody's willing to speak to someone, you know, whether it be a therapist or a good friend. But not everybody's willing to expose that deep and wounded part of themselves. And so because if we don't expose it, we don't get to connect with somebody else who says, oh, my God, I have the exact same thing. And then you say, oh, really, it's not just me. Well, I feel so much better. You know, when you're in a position like I am and like you are, when, you know, people confide in you and we get to sh hear what people are, you know, deeply feeling, we start to see, oh, my God, that is not just this person. It's not just me. This is the common human experience. And if it's the common human experience, why can't we bring this out of the darkness and put it out there on the table and figure out how we can all do a better job of coping with life, which is hard, yeah. right? Hard. <laughs> right. Why do you think there is that, that shame um, that, that people are, are afraid or ashamed to bring it out? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi there, I'm really excited to tell you about my latest ebook. It's four lessons that you can learn from the near-death experience without going through all the trouble of dying to learn them. I've been studying NDEs for several years now. I am completely convinced that not only are they 100% real, but that there's some very universal wisdom that we can get from the near-death experience. And I've distilled that down in this book into four short lessons. And I've also given you all the reasons why I believe the NDEs are absolutely real. So go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash NDE lessons to pick it up for free www.grief the number two growth.com slash nde lessons i hope you enjoy it i think maybe because people believe it's only them you know i mean you know you go on social media and i mean of course this is a podcast so it's social media but i remember i'm not a big facebook person but i remember over the years going on facebook which i never did very often but you know scrolling down and seeing that everybody was having an amazing life. Yeah. You know, this person was going here and doing this, and this is my love, and this is my great daughter, and I just left on this vacation. And, and you know, you know, five minutes on Facebook, boy, that's the most depressing exercise ever, because then I get to feel alone with my problems. And then I get to feel like, what's wrong with me? I, mm -hmm. I must not be navigating things well, because everybody else is having a grand old time. And here I'm sad, depressed, uh, anxious, uh, angry, disappointed and whatever else I'm going through. And, and this must just be my own problem. Like what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. I think it's that what's wrong with me thing that makes us feel ashamed because, you know, it's very rare to go on Facebook and have to see somebody say I'm having a really shitty day. You know, um, my husband and I had a fight, my kids on drugs and uh, you know, my boss just uh, gave me a, uh, a warning and <laughs> nobody's yeah. writing that stuff on Facebook. Why? Problem. Yeah. 
and and but it's not just Facebook. I mean, there you're right. Social media exaggerates that, but I think we and I think we also project onto other people how great their lives are, whether it's social media or not. Yeah, we look at our neighbors and we say they must be having a better life than I am. We we just we all seem to carry that around with us that there's there's something wrong with me and it's unique to me, and I think that's what causes the shame, as you said. I think so. And I mean, you know, I'm here to say, and I know you'll back me up on this, this is a lie. You know, every person on this planet is, has been, or will be confronted by difficulty. And and why am I so sure about that? Uh, because, you know, maybe it's a matter of philosophy. I write this, about this at length in my book, but mm -hmm. the way I see things is that Earth is a school. And we come here, it's like a boarding school, if you will, right? We leave home, we come to Earth, you know, maybe the semester is 80 years long <laughs> instead of, you know, a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, we come here to learn. And in my experience, when things are going well, humans don't learn anything, <laughs> right? If things are going great in my life, I really don't do much introspection. I don't ask some of the deeper questions about my own self. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just happy to show up and, and enjoy. And unfortunately, it's only when trouble comes knocking at my door or I go looking for trouble that, uh, in fact, uh, I start suffering. And when I suffer, it's so unbearable to be miserable that at that point, I have to dig deeper to figure out how to cope. I have to find some internal resources to find out how to get through the difficulty that I'm facing. And when I do that, and then I go through the difficulty, I come out wiser. I come out more skillful. And that's called evolving. And, and that's why we're here. We have come here to evolve as souls. And if we're not challenged by difficulty, we're probably not going to do that. And so I already feel, you know, if we were perfect, we, we wouldn't have come, you know. Earth has its challenges. That's the nature of being alive here. And so I'm quite certain that everyone's going to be confronted with difficulty. I mean, there are those people who stick their head in the sand and they, they sweep things under the rug and they're never going to go there and, and that's fine. But then there are the rest of us, right? Yeah. And so when I recognize that suffering and difficulty is in fact the common human experience, it helps diminish the shame because it's like, well, I know I'm not alone. I know that people are going through hard times, and I know that most people don't know how to handle it well. And I guess that was part of the impetus for me to, to write the book, because I felt like, why isn't this information out there? I mean, how do we all read all these books and go to all this school and not know these kind of basics about how to navigate life a bit better? I, I, I still don't have the answer to that. Yeah, well, what you just said in itself is, is a story. It's, it's a story that I happen to believe too that we that we come here to Earth to have these experiences. And I thought long and like, why do we have to suffer? Because people always ask me this: Why do we have to suffer? Because if we believe in soul planning, for example, why do we plan this? And I, I think it's a biological imperative because as biological beings, we are going to do the most efficient thing, whatever works, whether it's working well or not. We're going to keep doing it as long as it works. So we only break patterns when something doesn't work anymore. So we, we kind of have to have these things built in to kind of give us a kickstart to, to, to move, to change, to grow. Um, so that's, that's just my personal, that's a story that, that works for me. Right. So we see it similarly. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's a philosophy that not only makes sense to me and maybe, maybe some of your listeners as well, but I think it's, it provides a really good framework then, because mm -hmm. uh, when I reach a challenge, you know, which one of the chapters in the book, Emotional Repatterning, is based on, which I call gifts, right? Which is that the universe is going to gift us, right, with challenges, with opportunities, with hardships, in order for us to learn and grow. And, you know, I like to say that they never run out of wrapping paper up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> if we turn down the gift, well, we're going to get it again in another form at a certain point, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, if I want to keep on being hit over the head by a two by four, I can do that and I can keep turning down the invitation, but the gifts get a little bit bigger and a little bit harder to handle. So I've kind of learned, well, I might as well 
open the wrapping paper and open the box and take a look at what's in there and try to figure it out because if I take a pass on this one, I'm just going to get it later in a bigger version. And I'm personally tired of suffering, I can say. Uh, I want to learn how to go through a bit better. And I think, you know, some of these thinking traps and becoming familiar with them and, and also understanding how to change some of my, my limiting and negative beliefs is a kind of upgrade. And, and with that, I can approach life better. Yeah. I want to talk, I, I do want to dig into one of the things uh, more because I, I, I find all of them common to all the people I work with, with but one of them that is really big was this the idea of self-love. The idea of accepting, of loving ourselves and really, you know, cherishing who we are and understanding who we are. I find so many people, not only do they not have self-love, they almost feel afraid to have self-love. It's like, I, I'm not allowed to do that. Yes, I agree with you. And in fact, it's the first chapter of the book, because I think, you know, it all starts there. If I don't love myself, I mean, how well is it going to go on the outside? It's not going to go very well. And, and you know, I'll share a few thoughts about self-love, many of which are in the book and many mm -hmm. of which I have, I have talked with uh, patients about. So first of all, if I don't love myself, it's going to be impossible for me to receive love from anyone else. Because if I don't love myself, I can't believe that you love me. Because there's no basis for me to accept that you love me if I don't love me. Mm -hmm. So I can't receive love and I can't really give love from the right place if I don't love myself. And what does that mean, give love from the right place? So if I don't love myself, there's a huge, empty, aching hole inside myself where my self-love should be. And that empty area is, is a suffering for me. And most people want to fix their suffering. And so if I want to fix my suffering, I'm going to have to look for that love on the outside if I'm not giving it to myself. And how do I get that love from the outside? Well, I lose all my boundaries. I bend over backwards to be the nicest, greatest, most generous, sweetest, giving and helpful person there is in order to get that love and that appreciation back in order to help heal my own wound. Mm -hmm. And what's the result of that? Well, half the time I give and give and give and give in order to get back. And in fact, I don't get back. So then I'm angry and resentful because look at all I did and I got nothing in return. Mm -hmm. Or I do all that and maybe I am recognized and maybe I am loved. But like we said at the beginning, I can't really receive it because I don't love myself. So I can't even take in the reward. But if I'm giving in order to get the love that I don't have, we have to admit that's kind of an, a manipulation, right? I mean, not doing it consciously, but underneath it all, it's like, well, I'm going to give, 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 because I really need you to give me something back so that I can feel better. And I've worked with a lot of people like this, not a lot of self-love, looking for it from the outside, will do practically anything to get it. And, you know, end up empty handed at the end of the day, which which just feels worse. <laughs> we'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best selling, easy to read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, or text growth, growth, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I like the way that you put that, because I've heard people say things like, well, you can't, you can't get love until you love yourself or something like that. And the thing is, it's not that we don't get love, because we're all, I believe we're all unconditionally loved, but we can't feel it. 
So yeah. it's it's there. It could be showered on us. And I, I think about some, you know, some people, some some stars who, you know, took their own lives and all the adoring fans they had. And you could see, um, I was thinking about the, the lead singer of a group, Lincoln Park. Um, and, and there's a video where he's singing this the song and you just you could just feel the pain in his voice and all the fans around him, you know, just adoring him and he can't feel it. And he ends up taking his own life. And that's really common for a lot of us. We we don't yeah. feel worthy of, of love because we don't love ourselves. Right. And, you know, this is a limiting belief. And, you know, in my world, uh, this is easily changed, you know, because then people say, well, how do I love myself? You know, yeah. I mean, I. Mm-hmm. I eat well and I get a massage uh, every few months and, uh, you know, like, of course I love myself. Well, you know, maybe not. Maybe in your conscious mind, you're 5% you love yourself, but you're 95%. If you're 95% doesn't love yourself, well, that's not going to feel like love. And, you know, the other thing that I think is a part of this discussion is, and I don't really know where this comes from, but when I talk to people about self-love, People cringe because they kind of feel like it's selfish. And Mm -hmm. people have this warped understanding of what selfishness is when it comes to self-love. And, you know, this has to be uh, debunked because there's a big problem there, you know. And here's what it looks like for me. Um, If I don't take care of myself and I don't love myself and I don't do everything for myself that I need and want, and fill myself up in order to give from that full place. If I don't do that, then I'm giving from a bankrupt place. I'm giving from an empty place, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know if I have $10 in my bank account and I'm giving away $50 bills right and left, I mean, is that going to work for anybody? No, it's not going to work. I cannot give from a place of emptiness. I can only give from a place of fullness. That's the only way it's going to work because that's the only way it's sustainable. So first, me. I need to be well within my own self from that full place. Oh, my gosh, the giving and the generosity could be endless. But from an empty, bankrupt, uh, miserable place, the giving that comes from there is not genuine and it's not sustainable. So I think people have to really understand that loving themselves, caring for themselves, doing things that feel good to fill themselves up is not selfish. It's required if you want to be a person that can then go out there and be generous in giving. Yes, exactly. I love that. It's required. Um, And, you know, I I can only speak for myself. And um, and I I grew up in America, so I can only speak for America. But I think there is something. Yeah, there's something about, even though we're such rugged individuals and stuff, but there's something about we don't want to be perceived as selfish. And for me, it kind of comes from church. And I remember in Sunday school, you know, them saying you have to put others first, you have to put others first. That's, that's what a good Christian does. And that's, that's a misperception of, of what it means to, to love your neighbor as you love yourself, because to love your neighbor as yourself assumes that you love yourself. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm hesitant to, you know, blame religion because some people get upset. But I, I also agree with you. I think that there is this understanding that loving yourself is selfish and, you know, being all about everybody else is where it's at. And I, you know, it, it, it's a tough one. It, I just, you know, look at the airlines, not that any of us have flown in the recent past, but mm-hmm. and it, in the good old days when you used to get on a plane. Uh, You know, they used to say, you know, if there's a problem with the pressure, mothers put your mask on first or parents put your mask on first. Why is that? If I'm fumbling with my kid's mask and my mask isn't on and I drop dead because of lack of oxygen, well, it's a lose-lose. I mean, none of us are going to be better off, right? If I put my mask on first and I'm breathing, well, then I can help everybody else on the plane, right? So, you know, maybe that's like a trite analogy, but... I think it's a good one. It's one I use all the time, frankly. I, I use it, I, I use it with my clients all the time. So I think it's it's so important to give people permission to take care of themselves. And and the people that end up coming to me a lot of times, the people that are stuck, the people that are burnt out, you know, I'll, I'll hear and it's usually women. I most of my clients are women, so that's just yeah. what it is. But it's like I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I give and give and I give, and nobody appreciates it. And I am totally burnt out. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, you 
you have to stop. You can't keep doing this. This doesn't work long term. Right, because you know the resentment is 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 the tough part. I, I also had a patient maybe just last week, and it, you know I agree most of my patients for this kind of work are women, but it happens to be a guy, and he bends over backwards to please his mother, goes down there on weekends, fixes her apartment, hangs the the picture, fixes the shades, and he comes home and he's doing stuff for his wife, and then he's taking his kids to the park, and he's just burning himself out. He's completely exhausted, and there's no joy in it. By the way, he's completely resentful. And then he feels guilty on top of it because, you know, he feels guilty that he resents. It's, my God, can we make, can we make it more complicated? I yeah. said, why don't you take a day off for yourself once a week? Do what you love to do. You're going to feel full. You're going to feel happy. You're going to feel grateful. And then the next day, show up for the other people and see if it feels any different. And yeah. he did that. And he said, wow, it was a life changer. It was a game changer. Yeah, you know, I'm really in- enjoying this conversation because as I've Got worked with clients and I keep and it's thought keeps coming. Why do we keep sabotaging ourselves? Why do, why are we making ourselves unhappy with guilt and regret and you know lack of self love? And and it does come back to this underlying subconscious belief that we just can't seem to get away from because we don't even recognize it. Yeah, and this is the problem with the things that are in the subconscious, right? I mean, uh, it's hard to access that. You know, the the other problem with a lack of self love, and maybe you've seen this too is this thing about perfectionism, Mm -hmm. right? Because somehow we try to overcompensate for the fact that we don't love ourselves by being perfect, as if that would prove either to ourselves or to others that in fact we are worthy of love. And people are so miserable with this need to be perfect. And when they drop the ball or they're not perfect, which of course none of us are, they feel so guilty. They feel, again, so ashamed and they beat themselves up, and then they just set the bar even higher, and then they're so resentful of the other people whose bars aren't quite as high as theirs, right? Because how come I have to live to this standard and everybody else gets to be a slacker? Yeah, but who put the bar there to begin with? And why is the bar there? Because even if you were perfect, you're still not going to be proving to yourself that you're worthy of love because you don't understand that that's actually the issue. Yeah, well, that that leads it's, and it's all ties together because that does lead to the regret and the and the guilt. And I was just speaking with someone yesterday who just went through an incredibly difficult experience and just you know did it fantastically, and then said, "Well, maybe I shouldn't have done that." Once once it was all over, it's like, and I'm, and I'm like, you know, you were going to beat yourself up either way, <laughs> because when we get to that point, it's like no matter what we do, it's never good enough for ourselves. And I and I've seen it with with I, I work a lot with parents who have lost children, and it's like, should I have not let her go out, or should I have let her go out? Was I too hard, or was, was I too you know was I too lenient? And I'm like, whichever decision you made, you were going to you were going to regret it because that's just that's our nature. That's that's the nature people fall into. I should say. Right. Well, you know, I mean, another another thinking trap in my book is regret and. You know, I quickly disillusioned myself or became less disillusioned about this subject when I I had this insight one day, and I don't know, it's helped a lot of people. I'll share it. Maybe you've already gotten there yourself. But the thing about regret that's so amusing is that we assume the path we did not choose would have worked out in the best possible way. Right. And that's crap. (laughs) I mean, you know, whatever works out in the best possible way. So we compare what we did and what we decided didn't work out very well Mm -hmm. with the path we didn't choose, which in our mind, we make this story about how wonderful it would have been. And where's the evidence of that? Maybe that path would have been far worse. But we never make up that story about the path we didn't choose. We only make up the story that makes us feel bad. (laughs) Why do we do that? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I've I've had the same thing, you know, and and I've said to people the worst word in the English language is the word if because it should not even exist. There is no if. There's what happened, and that's it. There is no what if something else had happened because what it what is is, which comes back to another one of your things. This is about acceptance, right? Accepting right. accepting what is, and but we again we we we're sabotaging ourselves. We're saying, if I had only done this differently, then everything would be fine. And there's absolutely no evidence of that. Exactly. And in fact, given, you know, the odds of things, it's not even true. 
right? So, I mean, to me, it comes back to the to the question, why are we so hell-bound on torturing ourselves? We seem to pick, you know, the worst possible scenario uh, to get in our heads. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, and then we just go around and around about that. And this is just an incredibly bad habit, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, me interpreting life in a way that makes me feel terrible, as opposed to me interpreting what happened in a way that makes me feel great, you know? Uh, you know, the, the analogy I like to use there is like, you know, I'm standing in front of my closet in the morning getting dressed, and I have hanging there a range of shirts. And one shirt is brand new, fits me fabulously well, my perfect color. And by the way, I got it on sale. And then there's another shirt at the other end of the closet that's, you know, a bit ripped. It has a big stain on it. It's a color that's terrible. It's it's out of style. It doesn't look good. I hate the fabric. You know, it's my choice. Which shirt am I going to put on? The one that makes me feel great or the one I feel terrible in? I have a choice about which story I'm going to tell myself about what happened. Why do I pick the worst one? Uh, because it, it, it solves nothing. It just makes me feel bad and I can't do my best work feeling bad. So could I zoom the camera back, say, okay, here are the facts. Here is one version of the story or one interpretation of the facts that I have been telling myself. Yeah. yeah, it makes me feel pretty bad. Is there another version of those facts that is equally true. I'm not saying make up a lie. Right. Another true version of the fact. And how do I feel when I try that one on? And then is there another one? How do I feel when I try that one on? And why wouldn't I pick the one that makes me feel better? Right? And and, and maybe people just don't realize that this is even an option. Well, I think that's that's a good point. I think people don't realize it's an option. Um, we've, we've been we've been taught or whatever with these these subconscious things we have they trap us in this and i like your word trap because it's we go around and around in circles not realizing i can get off of this and i can i can choose my thoughts and my cha- my thoughts affect my feelings and my emotions which affect my actions so i can i can choose that thought so i can i like that analogy of the shirt i can try this on that's why i, I say to people if something happens to you you can tell yourself one story about it how does that make you feel? Or you can tell yourself this story about it. How does that make you feel? And this story, as you said, is it's not a lie. It's like, it's almost like we don't want to believe anything that's too good to be true. If we believe that that difficulties in life are here to teach us lessons and they're sent by ourselves or by a higher power or however you want to look at it, but if we believe that they're lessons and that something good is going to come out of no matter what, that sounds too good to be true to some people. It's like, we we want to stay in that victim mode. We want to stay in the in the this is terrible. Right, but then you know, it's so hard to go through life like that. You know, I mean the, the rates of prescription of antidepressants, anti-anxiety pills have tripled in the last dozen years. It's incredible the amount of people taking medication. I mean, people simply don't know how to cope with life. And mm-hmm. because we're not taught and we don't have the tools, I I completely understand why, but You know, it's almost a matter of allowing yourself the permission to tell yourself a better story about what happened. You know, I I had a patient uh, a few months ago, actually a similar story in the book, who was in an abusive marriage. And uh, she finally, after years, got out of the marriage. And, you know, she feels so bad about herself and so guilty and so ashamed. And how come I let him say that to me? And how come I let him do that? And how come I stayed for so long? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's just this horrible story. And she feels so terrible about herself. And I said, well, is there a different way we can look at the same facts? I mean, you made it. You got out. You survived. Okay, it took you two years. It could have taken you 20 years. You might never have gotten out. You got out and you're well and you're safe and you did it. Why can't you be the hero of your own story? Mm-hmm. Why can't you walk around with your shoulders back and say, I'm a rock star? You know, I figured out a way of getting out of that story with the kids and there was a religious overlay to it. So it made it all the more difficult to get out and complicated things. I said, for me, you're amazing. But unless you see it that way, nothing's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. I completely agree. And I, that seems to be the biggest part of my job is just helping people 
see themselves in the way that that I see them. You know, it's like and I was talking to, with another life coach a little while ago, and I'm like, I kind of see myself as like a mirror. We can't see our own strength, our own you know, beauty, our own the, the, how magnificent we are. And so sometimes we need someone to hold that mirror up to ourselves and say, yeah, you, you know, you, you're so much more than you think you are. Um, so I love, I love the idea of this emotional repatterning to help people to, to start to change their thinking, you know, to get off of that, that loop that we're on. Yeah. And, and a lot of that has to do with the subconscious work. As we said, it's really a matter of changing beliefs, deep subconscious beliefs. And I talk about a technique in my book, which I share in detail and in a lot of depth mm -hmm. about it's actually a, a take home practice. You know, it's, it's, an, it's not just, you know, affirmations and goals and things in our conscious mind, mm -hmm. but it's a way of actually rewiring our thinking patterns to kind of drop in and replace old beliefs that don't work, aren't true, don't serve us. You know, there's nothing good about them. You know, with something that works, with something that's an upgrade, with something that makes me feel great. Why wouldn't I want to feel great? When I feel great, I show up. I do great work. I help other people feel great. And they help other people feel great. And then the ripple effect outward is great. The more I can shine my light brightly, the more it benefits myself and everybody else. And that's true of everybody. Yeah. So staying in this stuck mode of misery, wow, you know, we have choices. And some of the ways out of this uh, are easy. You know, we, we tend to think that, you know, you know if it's, if it's going to be important, it's going to be hard. Or if it's going to be, if we're going to make a change, it's going to be really hard. It'll take mm -hmm. years and years and a lot of work. Well, I'm here to tell you this is not true, mm -hmm. right? You know, changing a belief is super easy. It's just a belief. It's not a fact, right? We're yeah. just changing our perception. We're changing our prescription, I like to say, right? You and I both wear glasses. We know that if the prescription is not right, we're going to see things in a distorted way. Mm -hmm. And I think when we repattern the subconscious, as I teach in my book, Emotional Repatterning, mm -hmm. we're, we're actually changing the prescription in our lenses to be able to see life more clearly by working on upgrading how we feel about our own selves, right? Because the problem is never out there, as we all like to think it is. <laughs> the problem is always in me. And when I can work on that and I can fix myself and I can evolve, wow, everything on the outside feels and looks so much better. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but in my experience, I've never had any luck changing anybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've tried. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So give me an example of, of one of the techniques that's in your book that, that I can use to break some of these patterns. Well, a couple of, you know, I've been trained in many, many different techniques about how to break through on the emotional level, on the subconscious level. And so what I practice in my office is kind of an amalgamation of three, four different things that I've learned over the last number of years. Mm -hmm. But uh, the one of the, the basis of that, I would say, is actually the, something that comes from uh, a technique called brain gym. I don't know if you've ever heard of brain gym. I have not, no. Something that was developed uh, over a dozen years ago by uh, people who were looking to work with kids to help them improve their ability to learn. So these were kids maybe on the autism spectrum or kids that had uh, learning difficulties. And they had discovered a way of engaging the brain on a more holistic level to help children learn better. And, and essentially that was by engaging both the right and the left hand hemispheres of the brain at the same time. Mm -hmm. When we engage both hemispheres of our brain at the same time, the brain is in learning mode. It is in deep learning mode. And so from that place, we can engage the subconscious and replace old beliefs. So, for example, in this kind of a mode, if I want to believe that I love myself, I would write a statement to that effect. So, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. I love myself would be the statement. And while engaging the both hemispheres of my brain at the same time, and there's a few ways to do that that I explain in detail in the book, uh, I can put my brain in active learning mode. And then if I repeat over and over and over again, 
I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. I am teaching my brain a new belief. And by teaching my brain that new belief, I replace the old belief, which is that I don't love myself, with the new belief that I do love myself. And this is something that happens at a very deep learning level, which is not the conscious mind, it's the subconscious mind. And when I do this practice over and over again by writing statements of what I want to believe and then repeating them to myself over and over again while I'm engaging both hemispheres of my brain, it teaches my brain a new belief and it helps mm -hmm. rewire the old pattern. So it's actually easy, fun, um, and very accessible. So, I mean, that, that's the kind of cool thing because, you know, we, we usually think that change has to be painful and hard. And I'm sure you've realized it too, and I have in my own life, sometimes the most profound things are the easiest and simplest things that we just simply overlook. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. And some people think, well, you know, you, you touched on earlier, I'm just going to take a, a pill and that's going to fix me. And the thing about you know antidepressants, and I, if you need to be on medication, you should be on medication. So I'm not telling anybody right. to get rid of their pills, but there's no evidence that they work, especially long term. They seem to work right. for a few people for a little while, but into, over long term, they just don't work. We have to we we have to do the, the this work, but this is it's, it's not really hard work. It, it's really coming down to understanding that we have a choice. I think the biggest yeah. thing about it is that is. Is, as you said, kind of uncovering that subconscious, understanding that I have a choice which thoughts I have. And if I don't like a thought, I don't have to keep thinking that thought. Because right. most of us think the thoughts just, they just come, right? It's like, a, it's like a third person talking to us. It's like, we can't shut them up. Right. You know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, like you're saying, understanding that you're the master of your own destiny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a very empowering thought. Uh, and when I'm the master of my own destiny, well, yeah, maybe that's a big responsibility, but I also then move into the power position because, you know, I find that a lot of people are so used to, uh, interpreting life, uh, as, as, as if it's, you know, the other person's fault, you know, my boss did this and my wife did that and my kids this and my friend did that. And, you know, it's really all about how the other people screwed us over. And then, well, what do you expect? You know, he, you know, I'm stuck with this, you know? And one of the things that really gets the, the hair on the back of my neck standing up is when, you know, someone in my office will say something like, you know, my, my, my wife always makes me feel bad about myself. Yeah. And I'm like, really, you know, your wife makes you feel bad. What, what does she have? Like some kind of, you know, switch <laughs> that she, you know, like, you know, pushes the on off, but how does she make you feel anything and isn't that language so disempowering i mean why don't we work on the language first because the language reveals something very deep about how you yeah. process it you know what if we said you know when my wife get, does and says certain things i feel bad i feel sad you know when this happens on the outside i feel a certain way well that's already a huge upgrade because when we say it like that, well, then I can decide to feel otherwise, or I yeah. can, you know, work with the, the situation and see it differently, right? Because then it's me, me feeling something, then I can maybe feel something else. Mm -hmm. But if somebody else is making me feel something, well, how disempowered can you be at that point? Yeah. Because then, well, what can I do about it? I mean, they're making me feel these ways and I'm stuck. Yeah, and that's an excellent point about how language, I think, is so important. Uh, and that's how we say it in English someone made me feel this way and literally that's not true as you said no one can make you feel anything we have a choice but we 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 give away our power when we use that so i there's sometimes i'll use language that sounds awkward to people because i don't want to say certain things like someone made me feel a certain way because it's not true and that brings me to the, the i want to we, we're running um close to the end but i want to talk about another trap where you talked about our, the way we view death and i very rarely use the word that someone died because my belief is that people don't die so talk about the trap of death right so yes i agree with you the body dies you know i i kind of see the body as like a rent-a-car you know we we come into earth to have this pool 
this learning experience. We need to rent a body because we need the body in order to have the experience of life. And when the, the duration of the contract is over, we return the car and then we go back home. And so, you know, the body is just the vehicle with which we can experience life on the physical plane. And certainly when we see it that way, well, passing and death of the body, I think becomes a lot more palatable. Um, you know, can we realize that this is a temporary situation, Earth? <laughs> this is not, this is, I mean, a lot of people like to say it's an illusion. I'm not sure it's an illusion. It seems pretty real to me. But it, it, it has its it has its finite uh, time and it has its purpose. You know, the purpose of being here on earth and being alive is to experience ourselves and situations which come up, which challenges us so that we can evolve. And there will be an end date there. And when we go back home, we will get to process all that we lived and evolve and grow from that. And I think simply that paradigm shift, at least in my body, when I speak about that and see it that way, you know, provides a big sense of relief. I think when people don't have that perspective, I think there is a lot of anxiety because, you know, if I don't see it that way, well, then I feel more scared because I don't really know what I'm doing here. And I don't really know what's going to happen after. And when I'm more scared, it's because I don't feel safe. And when I don't feel safe, then I'm anxious. And a lot of people's anxiety is so focused around health and safety. And I work with so many people that have anxiety about their health. And I work with so many people that have anxiety about their kids and their kids' health. And I think the root of all of this is fear of death. Because, you know, rather than work on the leaves, I like to work on the roots. Because when we work on the roots, the leaves get better. And if we work on the leaves, we're going to be here a really, really long time. Because there's a lot of leaves. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's get down to it. What's underneath all of these difficulties and this hardship, right? If I could make peace with my own eventual death and the death of the people that I love, and I know that you lost a child, and, and I also had a son who battled leukemia when he was 10, and we went through hell for two years. I mean, thankfully, he lived. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it wasn't obvious that that was going to happen. And one of my very best friends lost a son at 12 to a brain tumor, and I lived through that with her. So I'm no stranger to these topics. Mm -hmm. um, but when we make peace with the fact that, you know, nobody dies, they just, you know, return the body and they go back home, and, you know, they're all there waiting for us. And we're all going to reunite on the other side and debrief this whole this whole school uh, experience. Uh, wow, it just shifts the perspective and it makes you realize that I'm here for a purpose and I want to make the most out of it. So how can I engage better with life so I can suck the marrow out of it? You know, get all the juice out of it. Do what I'm supposed to have been doing here and be proud of myself for showing up really well as best as I could in any moment, in any case, and, and really try to go through life in a way that on my deathbed, whenever that comes, I can say, you know, I wasn't perfect, and I screwed up an awful lot, but I was present, and I tried hard, and I really tried to go through things and learn what I could and evolve as much as possible and show up for other people in the best possible way. I think at the end, I'll be pretty proud of myself if I can say that, and maybe that's a good reframe. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, you were saying before we start, you felt we had met before. I felt like we've met before because you said exactly the way I feel about life and death and the whole thing and the idea of an illusion. I'm, I'm, my background's engineering, so my, I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. I love science, and I know that there's some things. There's, there's simulation theory that says the universe is an illusion, and some people say it's like a dream. And my thing is, whatever we perceive is real because when you're in a dream, it's real. While you're in that dream, it's real. So it, whether this is a dream or not, it's it's real. What we go through is real. The pain is real. It's it's all real, but it's temporary. And what I what I try to get across to people is because it's temporary, when things are bad, they're only going to be bad for so long. And when things are good, they're only going to be good for so long. So enjoy the things that are good while they're here. And like when when my girls were young, you know, I enjoyed every every possible moment because. My one daughter's in spirit now. My other daughter has grown. 
I don't have little kids anymore. So you, you enjoy those things. But also when you're going through the, the tough times, you know, it's not going to last, you know, forever. And so what I, you know, I try to tell, tell people to do is like you just talked about is what's the lesson in this for me? Why, why am I having this experience? What am I supposed to learn from it? And that way, that painful thing that you're going through, no matter how painful it is, you're looking for some redemption. And I was, I was talking with a, a client yesterday. And even when I just heard him ask that question, I was like, that's a breakthrough. The fact that you're even asking the question, he said, I don't understand why this keeps happening. And it's funny because he immediately started giving reasons why he thought it was happening. I said, it's interesting. You start off by saying, I don't know how it ha- why this is happening. But then you just told me why it's happening. You, you do know. At some level, we do know why we go through these things. Yes, I agree. I mean, you know, living through that nightmare with my son, uh, you know, just completely cracked me wide open. And, you know, did good come out of that? Absolutely. I became much more heart-centered and I became much more wise. And I think the book evolved from that experience. You know, Mm -hmm. would I have chosen it? No. Would you have chosen it? No. But we don't always get to make a choice about which gifts come our way. But I think like you did, I felt like, you know what? I don't know exactly what's in this for me, but I'm going to squeeze every drop out of this that I can, because there's certainly something in this for me if I'm living it. So I want to be there. I want to be present for that. And I think it's a great way to show up. You know, I don't do it every time. I'm not yet perfect. Not even a goal anymore, let's say. But, uh, you know, let's see. When we're confronted with hard times, that's the test of character. What now? Right? It's easy to show up when things are going well. We are all expertise in that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. When you you use the word test, I was talking with another client. We were talking about the idea of testing. So we, we hear, like, again, going back to the Bible, the idea that God tests us. And he goes... You know, why is why is God testing me when he knows how I'm going to come out? And I said, you know, the thing is, what I what we know is you can't fail. That's what that's what people don't realize about the, the so-called tests we go through. You can, we can't fail. Whatever we do, we'll, we'll either learn from it. You know, I, I say there are no mistakes. There's there are opportunities to learn. And we're all going to be whole. We're all going to it's kind of like waking up from a dream. When we go when we go back home, we'll wake up and. We'll have our debrief, but there's no real permanent harm here. Nothing. Our our loved ones that we think died, they didn't. They didn't die. They just stepped off the stage. Yep, I I totally see it that way. And you know, there's a great peacefulness that comes with seeing it that way. And it also kind of frames our lives when we see it that way because we understand, okay, there's a a purpose, and it's not forever. And how do I want to show up in this life? I mean, it's a question that we get to ask ourselves every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other, anything you want to say as a wrapping up, any last, any last thoughts you want to give? Well, I mean, only that, you know, I wrote this book, Emotional Repatterning, you know, from my heart, from mm-hmm. my experience, uh, both personal and professional. I feel like there were some really aha moments in there and some take home tools that can help us shift things in our subconscious beliefs. I hope that if people do get the book, that they find it of some value. I would love to hear all about it. Uh, oh. It's available, you know, where, where books are sold on all those major booksellers. But uh, feel free to reach out and contact me um, at info at emotionalrepatterning.ca. Uh, and I'd love to hear what you think about the book, because I, I really hope that it, 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 it resonates with you. If not each of the thinking traps, then maybe some of them. And how you like the technique that I introduced about how to rewire your subconscious beliefs and whether or not you feel it worked for you. I'd love the feedback. Yeah, that's I, I, I can tell the book's fantastic um, just from a conversation we've had. And just I think just reading through those eight traps and, and for people to understand and recognize the, themselves and just begin to make that shift. And then you have techniques to actually help them make that shift. That sounds that sounds wonderful. Um, so, Lisa, I want to thank you for your time uh, being here on Grief to Growth. It's been a pleasure meeting you and having this conversation. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. It was a great talk, and we are, we're definitely kindred spirits. <laughs> All right. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Grief to Growth. Brian hopes that you find this episode helpful and will come back for future episodes. Brian's best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted Not Buried, is a great resource for anyone who is coping with grief or knows someone who is. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, there are three things you can do to help. The first 
is to share the podcast with someone that you think it will help. The second is to go to iTunes, rate, and review the episode. The third way you can support the podcast is by becoming a patron. Head over to www.patreon.com slash grief to growth. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash grief, the number two, growth, and sign up to make a small monthly donation. Patrons get access to exclusive bonus content and knowledge that you are helping to spread the message of grief to growth. For more about Brian and grief to growth, visit wwwgrief growthcom Hi there. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What questions came up for you? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I invite you to visit us at grief to growthcircleso That's grief the number two growthcircleso to continue the conversation with me and with other listeners. It's a space to sound off, to share reactions, and to go deeper into the topics from the show. I look forward to chatting more, and I hope to see you there.